Welcome everybody to Monash University's webinar uh, from the frontline rethinking mental health treatment and personalized care. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which we all are meeting in our various places, the lands of the Kulin Nation, uh, the first peoples of our land and acknowledge uh, their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm your MC today. My name's Steve Jane and I'm the Dean of the Subfaculty of Translational Medicine and Public Health based at the Alfred Hospital. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you uh, all today to discuss what I'm sure we all agree is a critical area of medicine and healthcare in our society, which has really been highlighted uh, over the last eight to 10 months in the setting of the COVID pandemic. And I speak, of course, of mental health issues. Uh, we've got a stellar cast today uh, to speak to you. Uh, three eminent uh, clinical and research leaders uh, who will talk on various aspects of the challenges faced uh, in mental health uh, in the setting of the pandemic and more broadly. Uh, firstly, I would uh, introduce Professor, Professor Jayshree Kulkarni. Uh, Jayshree is a psychiatrist of more than 25 years experience. She's a leader of uh, Monash University's Department of Psychiatry at the Alfred Hospital and also the leader of the Intensive Research Unit uh, Monash Alfred Psychiatric Research Centre, MAPRC, uh, which has pioneered uh, many innovative therapies uh, in mental health and particularly in women's mental health, where Jayshree is uh, clearly an international leader. Secondly, we have uh, Professor Suresh Sundram, who uh, brings a different aspect. Uh, Suresh's interest is in uh, translational molecular psychiatry. And again, he's uh, focusing on understanding the molecular basis of mental health and using that to develop novel treatments for psychotic disorders, in particular, uh, schizophrenia. Suresh also has broad interest and he's had a, a long-standing interest in uh, refugee and asylum seeker mental health. And uh, we'd all, I'm sure, agree a particularly uh, critical area for research and development uh, in times that we've endured. And finally, uh, Professor Kim Cornish, a, a developmental cognitive neuroscience, also with a magnificent reputation, a superlative publication record known internationally uh, for innovative uh, research in neurodevelopmental disorders and the co-inventor of the TALI program, which is an attention training program to improve uh, cognitive skills in children with developmental delays. So I don't think anyone can complain about the lineup, three really outstanding uh, researchers in neuroscience and psychiatry, and uh, I'm delighted to be uh, asked to introduce all of them. Uh, they're going to speak for seven minutes each, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end of that. Uh, you can upload questions uh, as we go through the talks using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen in Zoom, which I'm sure everybody who's over Zoom is familiar with now. But to uh, open the proceedings, uh, I'd first like to introduce, and it gives me great pleasure to do so, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, Professor Christina Mitchell, who's going to give a forerunner speech to our three experts. Thanks very much, Chris. At Monash University, we are working hard to address one of the greatest challenges facing our community, mental illness, in order to have better treatment and personalised care so we can foster wellbeing through preventative strategies. This year has presented significant challenges for us all. As a community, Australia has, un has faced unprecedented bushfires, which were swiftly followed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The strict restrictions to movement and interactions, especially harsh in Victoria and now experienced in South Australia, have resulted in an economic downturn that has led to high unemployment rates and reduced social connection. One in five Australians will experience mental illness and half of all Australians will be diagnosed with a mental health condition over their lifetime. In 2018 alone, 2.4 million people over the age of 18 experienced high or very high levels of mental distress. Now, in this year of unprecedented change, disconnectedness and disruption, clinicians are reporting that there's been a spike in demand for mental health services in private practice, hospitals and helplines. Some recent modelling has predicted quite alarming increases in suicide, self-harm 
and mental health related emergency department presentations. While suicide modelling is very hard to accurately predict, what we do know is that particular sections in our community will experience greater impact on their mental health from the pandemic and that its impact will affect all of our community. We could witness or experience it where we live, learn, work and socialise as our colleagues, family and friends might be experiencing mental health illness and challenges to their wellbeing. Or we might be experiencing it ourselves. International surveys shows that women of all ages are experiencing significantly higher rates of anxiety and depression than men during the pandemic and their safety is at risk. Older citizens with a female majority due to their greater longevity understandably have increased fears about their health and safety if infected with COVID-19 as well as their financial security. So they're at greater risk of mental ill health as well. People with pre-existing mental health conditions or physical illness are also likely to be struggling more with COVID-19 related mental health problems. And mental illness and challenges to our wellbeing has a marked impact on our economy. The recent Productivity Commission report estimated that the cost of poor mental health and suicide in Australia was about 200 billion a year. Mental ill health and suicide in Australia directly cost the country between 43 and 70 billion during the period 2018 to 2019. The cost of disability and early death due to mental health is estimated to cost a further 151 billion a year. As health professionals and as a community, we need to talk more about how to promote well-being and how to develop good mental health. And talk more about addressing mental illness in the community and get better at recognising risks, symptoms and delivering treatments that lead to better outcomes for individuals and families. Increase in episodes and diagnosis means that now it's time to make big leaps in this area. It's not about playing catch up to band aid current overstretched systems, but thinking about a new playing field, a new horizon in terms of nurturing wellbeing and implementing the most impactful mental health treatment and care. As you will hear today, Monash is committed to building resilience in children so that they have a secure psychological basis and mental health to thrive. We are committed to reforming and addressing women's health, mental health and gender related disorders and examining trauma and its effects on the developing brain. And we are breaking new ground in precision medicine to spearhead a global paradigm shift in the treatment of severe disorders, including bipolar, schizophrenia and depression. At Monash University, we pride ourselves on our dedication to excellence and evidence based research that will break new ground in understanding the causes, symptoms, treatments and management of mental illness. And it is this translational research that will make a difference to the well-being and mental health at the community level, in our workplace, our schools and universities, in our families and amongst our friends and loved ones. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you today and to hand you over to our expert speakers who will bring unique insights into how mental health research and philanthropy could together work to build resilient minds and improve community wellbeing in Australia post bushfires and COVID-19. This Q&A session today is a unique opportunity to hear from these Monash University experts about the way forward for our communities post COVID-19. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris, as the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, is a, a passionate advocate for mental health research, and that will be borne out by the three speakers that uh, you're about to hear from. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Jashri Kulkarni, who's head of the Department of Psychiatry in the Central Clinical School at the Alfred Hospital, and as I mentioned, the Director of MAPRC, the Monash Alfred Research Centre. Jayshree is going to speak on the impact of COVID and in particular gender and trauma effects associated with the pandemic. Thanks very much, Jayshree.
Good morning, and thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Steve. Um, I'm delighted to be here to speak about rethinking mental health treatment and care. Unfortunately, the mental health system is a fragmented system and has many different components to it. But the end result is that many people with lived experience of mental illness and their carers are not getting the services that they need. And they also feel, and correctly so, that they're not actually getting the outcomes that they wish to receive. So this is why, in fact, we have a number of different approaches that combine research with clinical activities and the provision of new approaches to care. So to begin with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Susie's story. Unfortunately, it's not a great, it's not a happy story, but this is the story of Susie, who uh, in her, from her early life, uh, was raised by a single, a single mother who had many, many uh, partners. And unfortunately, one of her partners abused Susie sexually from the age of five to nine. This laid the foundation for considerable changes in Susie's life, with emotional trauma being writ large in her early years. Unfortunately, Susie became the troubled teen and uh, she had poor school attendance. She had deliberate self-harm, substance use disorder and became pregnant at the age of 16. Throughout this time, Susie received several different diagnoses of mental ill health conditions, including eating disorders, personality disorders, all of which really led to poor treatments and poor outcomes. Now Susie is 32 and she's still struggling with significant depression, with anger and with financial issues. She engaged in a violent marriage, which ended unfortunately um, with an episode of physical violence on top of all of the other emotional abuses. And that marriage ended after five years. Susie is now trying to raise a 16 year old son who himself has been diagnosed with autism. And she's doing this on her own with a number of factors that are not helpful for her. At the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre, we are conducting a great deal of mental health research and our approach is based on two major platforms or pillars. The first is trauma. And by trauma, we use a broad definition. This includes emotional, physical, sexual trauma. And it goes right across the life spectrum. But often trauma is the underpinning of a cause or a perpetuating factor in many different mental ill health conditions. We also base our approach on gender. And gender is a very broad definition according to the World Health Organization. It is not the biological male, female, sex only. It is about the opportunities, behaviors, attitudes that are afforded to a person by society because of their gender. And often the gender has a role in the development and the outcomes of mental ill health. These two factors together are new approaches to look at mental ill health, to look at the research in employing the latest in neuroscience, it's brain chemistry, brain biologies, uh, brain physiologies, and look at the genetics of different conditions to then have multidisciplinary psychosocial approaches that engage the psychology of the individual with the environment to then proceed forward in a unified way. We really believe in the unified approach to mental health because that's going to take us further. At the moment, we have different lobby groups lobbying for particular age groups like adolescents only. We have different lobby groups who are lobbying for particular disorders like just depression that's not gonna see the mental health field move forward. It has to be a new approach and it has to be integrated and whole. We also want to make a big point about the person with lived experience, the patient, the consumer, the client, whatever term you wish, to be informing the progress at every step. We are working on new treatments being developed for people with a range of different conditions. Um, and for example, in the trauma area, we're coming up with different treatments 
Um, we've done this with the help of NHMRC funding, as well as the Walensky Foundation. I'm looking at special hormone treatments for women with depression, or in fact, with other conditions. And I'm very grateful to the Felton uh, Foundation for this. We're looking at new clinical approaches by linking trauma with biological brain changes, renaming conditions like personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder, which is often the diagnosis that patients like Susie get. And it's not helpful. It's not a personality disorder. It's in fact linked to the trauma that she experienced and the subsequent biological, psychological changes. So destigmatizing these conditions was critical. We're developing special empowerment psychotherapies, a different approach to psychotherapy from where the patient was a mute, almost monosyllabic person who received therapy. This is not empowering the patient. So we turn it upside down and develop new therapies in which the individual is an active leading participant. We also are educating health professionals particularly in the area of domestic violence. There's a number of projects in which general practitioners or primary healthcare practitioners need help in recognising and then dealing with domestic violence. We're also about educating the general public on mental health. And we're very grateful to the Helen McPherson Smith Trust grant for helping us with this project. Domestic violence is a huge area. It involves a whole of community. And as such, it involves the whole of mental health and we are involved in a number of different areas to try and improve outcomes for people experiencing domestic violence. All of this is done in an action oriented way so that our results are quickly translated into clinical treatments in our own clinics, as well as informing the public mental health sector and other sectors about the latest research that we're conducting at the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre. We really believe that a new approach is required so that we can provide new understanding, new treatments and new services for people experiencing mental ill health. We propose a holistic approach using trauma and gender as the main platforms underpinning this work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jayashree. Um, a superb talk and, and much to think about. Uh, we'll move on now to our second speaker, who is uh, Professor Suresh Sundram. Uh, Suresh is Chair and Head of the Department of Psychiatry at the uh, School of Clinical Sciences at Monash Health and leader of the Translational Molecular Psychiatry Program. Suresh's interests are in personalised medicine, uh, which is a, a new area in all aspects of medicine, but particularly an exciting area in the realms of psychiatry. And uh, Suresh will talk about personalized medicine in the treatment of schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar disorder. Thank you very much, Suresh. Thank you, Stephen. Breast cancer 30 plus years ago when I was a medical student, was a death sentence for four in five women who received the diagnosis. This was due to the fact that treatments were imprecise, harsh, toxic, and were really only palliative in nature for most sufferers. The story is now completely different. Four in five women with the disease will achieve long-term remission, and many women will be cured of the disorder completely. The story is even better for some childhood and blood cancers. The advances that we've seen over the last 30 plus years in the treatment of these disorders is surely in part due to the destigmatization, the early screening and the early interventions, but they are only part of the reason. The main reason ha has been the innovation in the treatments of these disorders due to the bringing of genomic medicine to the diagnosis and treatment of many of the cancers. Here at Monash University, we believe that we can do the same thing for the treatment of serious mental disorders, disorders like depression, schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder. These are diseases of the brain, which have caused untold misery for many millions of people. 
we believe that neuroscience and genomic medicine is now poised to be able to transform the way that we understand, manage, and treat these disorders. We believe that after 70 years of no real advances, we are really on the cusp of a major transformation in these illnesses. Let me show you how we are doing this here at Monash University. Here at Monash University, we've established the Translational Molecular Psychiatry Program as a joint initiative between Monash University and Monash Health. What we intend to do is to be able to take clinical material from patients and families, collect their DNA and undertake whole genome sequencing. This will enable us to identify genetic risks which predispose particular people to the development of these serious mental illnesses. However, what we then do is to take these genetic risks and see whether or not they result in changes in the protein and brain cells of people who've had these illnesses. Here we use postmortem human brain tissue from the Victorian Brain Bank. And by undertaking this analysis, we're able to identify what are likely to be potentially pathological uh, molecules and genes which can cause or predispose people to developing these diseases. We then take that information and model that in animals. We create transgenic mouse models, that is animals that have got that particular protein or gene affected in a way that is comparable to what we see in the disease. And in addition to that, we also measure the changes that occur in the brain activity, the electrical activity in people with the illness. We then subject where we find commonalities, animals to the same types of tests which we see altered in patients with these disorders. We're able to do this because we have new computer-based tasks which are much more sensitive to probing the behaviors and learning abilities and memories of animals. These touchscreen tasks have revolutionized how it is that we can understand subtle changes in brain behavior and function in animals. Where we find abnormalities, we are then able to look in the brains of these animals at a microscopic cellular level to identify what are the pathways that are changed or altered by this initial genetic lesion. This is critical because these pathways will then provide us with molecular targets for the development of new therapies. These new therapies, once they're developed, will then be finally tested in the people who've exhibited that particular genetic risk or genetic abnormality. It's this type of recursive pipeline approach which holds the key to us understanding how it is that we will be able to transform the diagnosis, the treatment, and ultimately the management of people with severe mental illness. This type of paradigm change in the way that we approach mental disorders holds the key to how it is that these illnesses will be treated into the 21st century. I really believe that the revolution that occurred in cancer and other related disorders 30 to 40 years ago can now be applied to our understanding of mental disorders. This is not a single initiative. This has to be part of a global drive to change the way that we approach and think of mental disorders. And it's the type of initiative that Monash University is leading. We hope that with your support and with national support, we will be able to transform these diseases from the life sentences that they are today to illnesses that can be managed and controlled and maybe even ultimately cured. Thank you. Thanks, Suresh. Futuristic research at the cutting edge of personalized medicine, so a superb talk. 
Uh, this brings us to our third speaker. And again, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Kim Cornish, one of the true stars of the university. Uh, Kim is the director of the Turner Institute uh, for Brain and Mental Health and the university's Sir John Monash Distinguished Professor, uh, a title bestowed on our leading academics only. So a superb recognition. Kim's going to talk about the need to invest in our children's future mental health, a topic uh, dear to all of us, I'm sure, and the critical role for building cognitive resilience in a COVID normal world. Thanks very much, Kim. Today, I want to talk on an extremely important topic, scaffolding mental health through the gateway of cognitive resilience in our most vulnerable children. So let's meet Molly. Molly is six years old and started grade one at her local primary school in January this year. She seemed happy to go to her new school, but she was quiet and a bit withdrawn for some of the day. She was struggling to pay attention in class and to focus on listening to her teacher give instructions, but she was improving during the course of the first few weeks of school. But on March 24th, all schools in Victoria closed and were to remain closed for over 20 weeks before opening fully in October. In lockdown, studying from home became the norm. Molly's family blended and she lived with her dad her stepmom and two teenage stepsisters. Her dad and mom both work in a combination of part-time casual jobs and struggle financially to pay rent and amenities. COVID hit the family really hard. Both financially as both lost their jobs and emotionally as the family home became a pressure cooker. Homeschooling became almost non-existent. When we look at what the teachers were saying about Molly in the early part of the year, by, by mid-March, they were saying she's trying really hard in class to listen and keep up with her peers. And I know she's a good girl, but she can be a bit distracted and she seems shy. When Molly returned to regular school in October, on October the 12th, her teachers described her as a different girl overly anxious and worried all the time, so inattentive, she couldn't even stay even a few minutes on task. They noticed she barely talked to other children and she would sometimes lash out at them for no reason. Her reading and math were at an all-time low and her homework assignments were no longer completed. And when we look at what the teachers were saying about Molly by late October, is that she's not listening. I'm always telling her to pay attention. Why is she so anxious and nervous? She seems afraid of her own shadow. She's struggling even with basic numbers and letters and won't return homework. Developing and protecting the cognitive and mental health of our children is a fundamental priority for our nation. Children who are cognitively and mentally healthy have the best opportunities to thrive both academically and socially. We know that mentally healthy children are more proficient early learners, more resilient to change and enjoy more social connectedness. Our nation's future prosperity, its social cohesion and international standing depend on a strong, healthy workforce that has its roots in the childhood experience. In contrast, children who are especially vulnerable like Molly to developing poor mental health or a substantive risk of poor academic outcomes. We, we saw there that, that she was struggling with the basics of literacy and numeracy. They are at an increased risk of psychological disorders and substance abuse, early school dropout and reduced occupational opportunities post-secondary. Vulnerability to poor mental health arises early in life and can take various behavioral, social and cognitive forms. If left unrecognized and thereby untreated, even a few symptoms can have a truly insidious impact on a child's developmental trajectory across life. But who are our vulnerable children and how can we promote early interventions that capture and strengthen cognitive resilience and coping across this broad spectrum of vulnerability? This can include children in remote and regional districts, children from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, children with a developmental brain disability, and children from families living below the poverty line. 
It is clear to all of us that COVID-19 has exasperated an already vulnerable mental health landscape for Australian children. But instead of dismay at the task ahead, what if 2020 has provided an unprecedented opportunity to place a new lens on the existing mental health landscape within all of our communities, especially for our youngest populations? COVID-19 has provided the impetus for a paradigm shift, at least in my opinion. Never before in our history have we known so much about the developing brain across all of its levels, at the genetic level, the environmental level, the cognitive and the social levels. At this critical juncture, here and now in Australia, there needs to be a long-term investment and a coordinated strategy to effectively translate this knowledge into impact. So where do we start? Importantly, we know that building a strong coordinated network of cognitive capacities, which we call cognitive resilience. And these are attention. You remember these are what Molly was struggling on very early uh, as she started school. The ability to, to attend to task, the ability to focus on that task and the ability to withhold a response that we want to make, but we know it's inappropriate to do so. We refer to that as inhibitory control. We have studied these at length in late childhood and into the teenage years. And we know that if these are built and they're strong, it confers a protective benefit to the child in stressful or adverse circumstances or environments. But what if we could develop cognitive resilience even earlier in life, in the preschool and the prep years, when the developing brain is at its most malleable and highly sensitized to being trained and strengthened? Okay, so let me share with you an example that my team have developed at the Turner. We call it the Pillar Project and is funded by the Ian Potter Foundation. Focusing on vulnerable children aged six to eight years old in remote Victoria, we created a state-of-the-art suite of interactive games using digital technologies to tap varying components of cognitive resilience, such as inhibition, working memory and cognitive flexibility. These games are developed in collaboration with the children and teachers, and children use them over a period of weeks at set times. They're adaptive and can be used anywhere at home, the school, or in the community. This research project is ongoing for the next two years, and it will allow us that critical research evidence-based study that will allow us to, to say with certainty whether the games tap what we want them to tap. The unique capabilities of the Turner Institute in developmental clinical psychology, data science, AI technology and longitudinal approaches can make this critical vision to move from focusing on mid-childhood to late childhood and instead move into training cognitive resilience into much younger children. These capabilities of the Turner can make this a reality. In addition, our connections in the Southeast Corridor with Indigenous communities, refugee communities, low socioeconomic communities, and children with brain developmental disabilities, such as autism, can be a testbed for a national approach that can be rolled out as early as 2022. And if we were to take this one step further, and in partnership with industry, local communities and their schools, and clinical mental health services, collectively to develop novel cognitive resilience tools that are engaging, can be accessible to all families, scalable to even the most remote communities and personalized to each child. Such innovative models of care will see child, child mental health experts creatively utilize digital technologies capable of being personalized to child and community needs and scaled around the nation to its furthest reaches to augment current home and school-based interventions. Australia now at this moment has a real opportunity to develop an adaptive and resilient generation capable of leading the nation through future global challenges, be they bushfires, new pandemics, global crises, the absolute best investment we can make as an innovation nation is in the health and flourishing of our children, all of them.
Thanks, Kim. Superb talk. Uh, I, I'm sure that resilience is foremost in many of our minds, and particularly in our children, as something that is a, a, of critical significance at the moment. And I think Kim's given us a compelling case around that. So that concludes our three speakers today. I think it's no secret that research in general in our country is uh, chronically underfunded, uh, but I think this is even more significant in the setting of mental health, uh, where grant funding is really uh, appallingly low compared to other clinical disciplines. And for that reason, we rely very much on our community for support on philanthropy to make sure the superb work that you've heard of, very different in its scope, uh, continues on through Monash University and why we're very grateful to you all for coming to this webinar. Uh, there's a Q&A button down the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free uh, to put questions in there and I'll uh, get to as many as I can and we'll try and share them across our three speakers. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll open with uh, one, which I think uh, I'll address initially to Jayshree, but all three could answer this, I think. Uh, what, what do you see, Jayshree, as the failings in our community mental health approach that have been unmasked by both the bushfire and COVID pandemic? Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. Um, look, I, I actually think it's worth quoting the former mental health state minister who said, unfortunately, with uh, bushfire and COVID, the small cracks became wide chasms. And so what it showed up is actually the fact that um, the resourcing has not been enough. So that, for example, we have an issue at the moment, which is that the public mental health systems uh, do very good work and they're dealing with the very sick, very severely unwell. The um, community resources which got tested through COVID, particularly Lifeline and other such resources, also did, did pretty well with uh, that terrible crisis that they were reeling from. But it was the middle, the middle sector with people who suddenly developed depression, anxiety, of which many were women, and there wasn't a resource that the state had in the public system to be able to particularly manage that. That's usually the private uh, medicine domain, but of course, not everybody can afford private health insurance. So this sort of system uh, resourcing issue has been shown up. That's one thing. The other side of it is, as you've, as you've said, and, and my colleagues have said, the research in mental ill health conditions and mental health conditions is really about trying to get better with identifying early, but trying to identify definitively what the problem is and then have uh, specific treatments that tackle the problems. Thanks, Jayashree. Uh, Kim, to you, a question from our audience is, how do uh, teachers and parents ensure that kids are positioned to cope in the setting of something like the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's it's parents and teachers having the tools, having the evidence-based tools, which we have developed at Monash and in particular at the Turner, that actually focus on helping children learn, not put not just learn, not just continue in their in their in their in their academic work, but also get those life tools that help them stay focused, that help them stay centered um, and connected with the people around them. Um, young kids get so distracted all the time. In lockdown, in particular, it has been such a nightmare for so many parents of young children. So having those tools available, having them developed that are evidence-based, and the evidence base is critical because otherwise they're worthless, um, and having them accessible to all, wherever you are, whether you're here in metropolitan Melbourne or whether you know, you're in the rural communities across Australia. Uh, Suresh, to you... Um you highlighted the advances in molecular medicine in breast cancer and, and blood cancers and a range of other diseases. Why has psychiatric illness been so slow in this area, so far behind in terms of starting to look for molecular tools that could be useful in designing personalised medicine? Thanks, Steve. The real problem has been the accessibility to tissue. So with, with cancers, blood cancers, breast cancers, but most of the other physical illnesses, it's possible to get a little bit of tissue that's been affected by the disease process and to subject that tissue to the sorts of advanced technologies that have developed in, in molecular medicine. The problem that psychiatric disorders face, in particular the disorders that we've talked about, autism, depression, schizophrenia, 
we know that something's wrong in the brain, but you can't put your finger on it. There's no identifiable uh, lesion or cell or part of the brain which is affected in a way that we can then sample that and subject it to the types of molecular approaches. It's only really now, Steve, with the very large genetic data sets, so these are international collaborations with hundreds of thousands of samples, that we're beginning to get the genetic clues which we can then take in to the postmortem human brain, the tissue that I mentioned, but also in the animal modeling, which can then demonstrate these, uh, the effects of these types of genetic variants on uh, brain function, and then through that, be able to identify what might be the pathological mechanism. Great, thanks, Suresh. So the saying goes, with crisis comes opportunity. Uh, Jay Shri, I might ask you, what, what do you think are the opportunities that these crises in our community have now presented? What can we grasp and really drive forward based on this? Yeah, so I, I think you, you're quite right that there are a lot of opportunities, but one of the biggest opportunities, I think, is that sense of having a look again uh, and, and to stop doing the same old, same old. And that's something that I think at Monash, We've, we're really good at um, you know, really taking a fresh new approach. We're not scared to, to do something that is not traditional. And I think that's been one of the big things that we can do. Certainly we are also uh, looking at better uh, application of neuroscience right across the mental health condition uh, because we recognize this as brain, brain issues. So it's not something that's universally held, um, but certainly we are able to apply that to the issues of environmental impacts. You know, there's this, this odd traditional belief that brain is separate to environment, is separate to uh, temperament or behaviour, and it's absolutely wrong because it's all connected. So we've got this opportunity to have a look at what the reactions to the environmental stressors with COVID have been in both lab, in clinic, and then also into public health domains. And I think that's what some of the um, opportunities are that we can rethink and innovate. And we've got the mechanisms to do that um, in our particular university. Thanks, Jayshree. So Kim, there's a lot of discussion that maybe the worst is still yet to come in terms of the mental health effects related to COVID. So first I'd ask you, do you actually believe that? Do you think there's still significant challenges and hurdles for us that are even greater than we've already faced? And if that is the case, what can we do to safeguard our loved ones, our children, our colleagues uh, from these future effects? Yeah, I think possibly the worst is yet to come. Um, I think the long-term impact of, particularly for young kids um, in shutdown and so in lockdown, um, when there's like limited help available, often by, by parents, you've also got a very stressed family environment for so many of these kids. You've got children who are from quite vulnerable populations whose family life was already quite sensitive to start with, which has now been heightened. You'll see young children coming in who were really anxious, a bit like our case study there, Millie, who came in quite shy to start with, but after the pandemic came in overly anxious. Um, and I think the long-term impact, if we look at the bush virus and we looked at the impacts there, there was, um, you know, distress, psycho poor psychological well-being, anxiety, more cases of depression in young kids. Um, we were, in our case, we can expect the same. Um, we can expect some academic um, issues going forward in the next year for the next NAP, NAP plan, for example, but those can be remedied. Um, it's now building an, an environment where our children can talk about mental health, where we have the tools, whether they're digital or not, that can actually reach children in remote communities, in different communities, and not not just assume a one size fits all is the most appropriate approach to anything. Like Jay Shui says, it's not the same anymore. We can't um, just use the same old approaches. We can't just expect that young kids who have gone through this pandemic are all going through it in the same way, the same place, same time. We need to be adaptable, our resources need to be adaptable, and we need to have services that seek to strengthen, you know, issues with psychological well-being before they become clinical issues. Great, Kim. So Suresh, a, a perennial question for an impatient public. 
what's the timeline between the sort of work that you're really starting to get into now before you could envisage there might be targeted therapies for specific uh, mental health disorders? Yeah, great, great question, Steve. Uh, it wasn't mine, actually. It was yeah, it was Brian, Brian Dean, who Jay Shree and I know very well. I think um, Brian, hi, Brian. Uh, uh, and somebody that I collaborate with very closely with the Victorian Brain Bank and the molecular studies that we've been doing. And it's, it's been Brian's um, life work as well. I, the answer that I've, I've written uh, is actually the true answer, which is that when this approach was proposed for cancers, the time frame was thought to be decades. And it was really only because it captured national and international attention and as a consequence became a focus of national and international priority that that timeline was able to be accelerated. And so the sorts of advances, which as I said, you know, 30, 35 years ago um, were undreamt of have become a reality in the last one to two decades. And I am hopeful that with a similar sort of concerted national, international effort we can do the same for, for the major mental disorders. The final point I'd make with regards to this is that the whole key to precision personalized medicine is in fact to identify what may be the specific causes in any one or group of people and not to treat the disorders as a conglomerate sort of homogenous group of uh, a homogenous illness. We know that disorders like major depression and autism and schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all these illnesses have their own individual expression in people. And we expect that many of these uh, uh, causative lesions are also relatively specific to individuals or small groups of individuals, each of whom will have their own specific type of treatment. Right. Thanks, Sonish. Uh, there's a great question here, Jashi, I'll ask you, uh, which is about destigmatizing mental health and the importance of that uh, for the individual and for families. I'd be really interested to hear your comment on that. Yeah, so there are many conditions that are poorly understood. And I, I, gave, I give the example that I gave in Susie's case of this very odd condition that's called borderline personality disorder. It's a big condition. It's got lots of presentations, but commonly the people who experience this will present to emergency departments and other places with deliberate self-harm, so cutting themselves. It's, a, it's more commonly seen in women than men, but nonetheless, this is an important thing to destigmatize. If you tell somebody they have a personality disorder, that's quite a statement. It, in fact, invariably ends up in the person thinking they're pathetic, they just don't have it, they're sort of lacking in moral fibre or some other uh, very stigmatising self, uh, you know, taken in type term. It doesn't help the uh, person, but it also doesn't help the clinicians and the therapists because they often give up. And it's the, on the surface, it looks like this person is able to control things. But when you actually stand back and look at what's going on, there is actually a trauma that's often much more common in this person but it's been missed because this person hasn't come forward with the story. When we adopt a different mindset, that this person is actually the subject of trauma, we can then use different trauma modalities, like in PTSD trauma. We can also look at the brain in trauma and think about different neurochemistry and provide a, a fresh new approach that validates the individual and gives the clinicians some better tools so that everyone's not floundering around thinking that this is just bad behavior. Thanks, Jayashree. Kim, we've seen a, a disproportionate effect of COVID in certain community groups. Um, I think, obviously, certain ethnic groups, socioeconomic groups, and so on. So the, the audience are interested to see how your program reaches out into Indigenous, uh, uh, non-English uh, speaking, uh, asylum seeking, refugee groups, etc. How, how do you broaden your program to make sure that we cover those aspects of our community? Yeah, the key is, is co-design with your communities. You need to get into your communities, you need to work with researchers, community leaders, 
teachers, families within each of your separate communities in order to gather, you know, the, the tools and the resources that would be relevant to them and their families. You know, in particular, working with teachers, in you know, teachers wherever I've been, whether we've been working with the remote communities with Ian Potter or children with learning disabilities, which has been my lifelong career um, area. The key to getting the most out of every program, out of every child, is to have a solid partnership with families and in particular with the teachers it is at least at what i find in the last few years when we've looked at very early attention in young children across both um remote rural um metro um melbourne and victoria is that we find teachers want to do it they a massive uptake by teachers you know, put, getting down doing focus groups with teachers with families getting you know resources like digital technologies, upskilling teachers, upskilling families is the way to do it. And like I said earlier, it is not a, a one size fits all. The best results come when you're a part of that community. Suresh, um, I'll ask you, what, what is the breadth of uh, mental health issues that you think could be reachable using your molecular approaches? Do you think this is going to be something that could be an answer for any of the mental health disorders or do you think there are particular areas that are more likely to yield results earlier than others? So this is a really challenging question, Steve. And, and the reason it's challenging is because in the general public conception, there's been a blurring of the boundaries between what we might term mental health and well-being and what we might term mental illness or mental disorders. And in particular, this is because all of us have the whole gamut of human experience and the whole gamut of, of human emotions, which are part and parcel of life and which incorporate all the sorts of features that we normally um, experience or, or associate with, with life experience. So we all feel sad, we all feel elated, we can all feel uh, jealous, we can all feel envious, all these normal human emotions which are pathological in a set of disorders. So major depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or autism have many of these emotions, but emotions within a pathological context. So to come back to your question, what I would like to do from a public perspective is for people to dissociate what is normal human experience from what are mental disorders and mental illnesses. And what I am focusing on and the work that we're focusing on is identifying those mental disorders and treating them. This is not about trying to pathologize normal human experience. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to ensure that we keep a clear boundary between those two sets of experiences, the disorders on the one hand and normal human experience, even as unpleasant and, and uh, adverse as it may be, it's still part of normal human experience to feel, for example, depressed or traumatized by the effects of the, the bushfires or COVID-19, but it doesn't necessarily result in disorder. Mm. So Jayashree, uh, violence against women is a, an absolute scourge in our society at the moment and obviously has been heightened uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, Somebody is interested in, in what our approaches as a community should be in, in supporting women and families who are in this position. Yes, I mean, it's, it's really been a, a terrible, terrible situation with lockdown and isolation. Um, again, we, we talk about violence or interpersonal violence across the gender spectrum. Of course, women are more likely to experience that. Um, in, intriguingly, and not a good intrigue, is, is that mental health aspects of downstream effects of domestic violence and even acute uh, mental health effects have not been a priority particularly. We've had some great work done by the police, the judiciary, the home uh, sector, you know, the education sector, they've done a good job, but we need much more in terms of the acute support for uh, people who experience the violence. But we also need to understand more about 
what actually witnessing violence does in the developing child brain, like, like Professor Kim Cornish has been uh, speaking about, because there are actual circuit changes, there are neurochemical changes that occur. So we've got some downstream effects as well. But I think the mental health sector can do a lot in terms of identifying early, but also then providing empowering therapies, taking a new stand on what the behaviours might come about from being traumatised. Also um, to inform and educate as we're doing uh, general practitioners who are the primary uh, frontline workers who sometimes find it absolutely overwhelming that they're not quite sure what to do with this. But overall, to see this particular issue as a mental health um, potential place to intervene to prevent a lifetime then going forward of a whole range mm -hmm. of conditions. And I think that's, that's really critical that we've not recognised trauma uh, for the absolute huge factor that it is in creating mental ill health from both mm -hmm. early and down, down track. So Kim, uh, I think there's a perception in the community that we, we don't do mental health very well in terms of intervention and management. So let's just get rid of the current system and I'm going to ask you if you could replace it, what, what would be the tenets, what would be the pillars that you would be looking for for a new paradigm for treating mental health? I would be looking for pillars of great clinical practice I would look in for pillars of research evidence and the intertwining of new models of clinical care um, intertwined with, with great research, evidence-based research. I'd, in the case of children and families, I'd be looking at, at bringing in you know, the teachers and, and recognising their worth in the process of, 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 of seeing how children are when it comes to, to poor mental health you know, issues at home, issues at school, issues with peers, and, and for those pillars to be in place and to not wait until, you know, you're a middle-class white female who rings up the phone to a GP and says, can I have a, um, an appointment at Headspace? You know, make all of this so available and make services so they are flexible, adaptable, digital if needed, and... And, and, and available to all, working in partnership with teachers, with families, with new, you know, clinical health models that incorporate research as, as a core practice. Suresh, I might ask you for comments on that as well. Yes, thanks, Steve. I, I agree with everything that, that Kim said, and I would emphasise that the elements around treating the severe mental disorders requires a whole of person approach. And in thinking of a whole of person approach that includes families being involved in the care of, of patients. And what it requires is a wraparound. So it's not just about having um, clinical mental health services. It's about the interface with the social support systems, with the justice system, with welfare, return to work, employment systems. It's about being able to provide an integrated care package, which we haven't been able to do, Steve. The, the great tragedy of the severe mental illnesses is that most, uh, you know, the life expectancy is about 15 to 20 years less than the mainstream population. And most of these people are dying from cardiovascular disease, which is unrecognized or untreated. So it's about including and incorporating physical health care into the total care package as well. All right. Well, we could go on for a long time. There's plenty of questions, and I apologise to uh, all of our watchers who've sent questions that I haven't had time to get through, but that uh, brings us to uh, the timing that we have to finish up. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the Dean of the Faculty, but more specifically our three speakers who I think all gave very different but fantastic perspectives on what our community has faced and I think some hope for the future. I hope everyone watching has been galvanised uh, to realise that support for mental health research is absolutely critical for the continuation of the outstanding work that we've heard of today. So thank you very much for your attendance. We're very proud of our academics at the university and we think they've showcased uh, their wares superbly today. So thanks one and all for your attention and good afternoon. <laughs>